Uh, I'm Dixon Osborne, I'm the Executive Director of the Center for Justice and Accountability, and I want to welcome you to the Google Community Space this evening. Uh, today is, we're celebrating our 21st anniversary for the Center for Justice and Accountability, so we're looking to the next 20 years on how to hold human rights of users accountable. We uh, have a virtual gala this year online, so if you've not looked at that, we encourage you to go online and, and look at the virtual gala we have a number of incredible speakers who've done videos for us with the typical awards that we, human rights awards that we provide. Uh, but this evening, thanks to the Professional Network for Human Rights, uh, we're doing a NCLE class, uh, which is on how to hold human rights abusers accountable. That topic, unfortunately, remains very timely. Uh, next week is the 25th anniversary of the Rwanda genocide, but we see genocides happening today uh, mass atrocities occurring in Syria and against the Rohingya and all over the globe. Uh, so we have for you, though, know, our incredible dynamic legal litigation team that will give you insights on uh, sort of our approach in trying to hold human rights abusers accountable. And I'll let each introduce themselves, but I'm going to first turn it over to Carmen Chan, our legal director, to get us started. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, so I'm Carmen, I'm the legal director here at SCJA. Thanks um, everyone for being here for the non-virtual part of our virtual gala. Um, so, I, I, uh, so I think that in order for us to spend as much time as possible talking about CLE type things, I'm just gonna direct you to um, your virtual swag bag, which I think you should all have a link to, um, that should contain sort of our bios and all of the written materials uh, that are um, associated with um, tonight's presentation. Um, and so it includes some of our cases, some articles, um, uh, and, and that sort of thing. So um, so with me are my colleagues from CJ's legal team. Um, we have Daniel McLaughlin, Ella Matthews, and Yishin Sarkarati. Um, and, uh, and as many of you know, um, CJA is a human rights organization based here in San Francisco. Um, we litigate around mass atrocity um, uh, in very many fora, um, including uh, through the international mechanisms. But what we want to talk about here tonight is the, um, is the work that we do here in US courts, um, what I call sort of pragmatic universal jurisdiction. And so these are the civil cases that we bring here in the United States. Um, and, uh, and we're going to highlight some of the work that we do in sort of the different modes of working um, uh, in the U.S. courts and how they, um, uh, uh, you know, sort of um, are, are reflect different legal strategies um, and also have different impacts um, uh, on the ground in the countries um, where these crimes took place. And so the run-up show is going to be a little bit like this. So Ella is going to start off. Um, by um, talking a little bit about, well, what is this thing, universal jurisdiction, that we're talking about? Like, what's a pragmatic approach to universal jurisdiction? Um, and then Daniel is going to talk a bit about the alien tort statute, the rise and fall and possible resurrection thereof, um, uh, through, um, uh, and then touch a bit about on, on a case that we brought on behalf of the family of um, the famed Chilean singer Victor Hara, um, and the intersection and dilemmas that we. Uh, with, the, with the Alien Tort Statute in that case. Um, Yushin is then going to talk about um, the work that we've been doing in Liberia um, and how transnational uh, litigation is impacting accountability efforts there. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, our case against the Assad regime on behalf of the family of Marie Colvin, a war correspondent, um, and our use of the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act in that litigation. Um, and then um, after all of that, then I hope we have some time for uh, discussion. So, um, Ella, take it away. Is it on? Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, so as Carmen mentioned, I'm gonna chat briefly about kind of universal jurisdiction and what this concept is and how um, it fits within the US legal system and how CJA tries to leverage it. Um, so universal jurisdiction is a concept in international law um, by which every country um, can assert jurisdiction over certain types of human rights abuse. And the reason um, this principle exists is because international law typically constrains countries in what cases they can bring, right? Usually it's because the victim is a citizen of the, 
state or the crime occurred within the state's jurisdiction, like territorial bounds, or because the perpetrator is in the country. And that's why a state can then assert jurisdiction over that crime. Universal jurisdiction is the exception to that rule. Um, you know, the international community has decided that there are certain crimes that offend um, the print every, like uh, the concern of every country and therefore every country should be able to assert jurisdiction for these cases, no matter where the victim is, no matter where the perpetrator is, no matter where the crime occurred. And typically um, we see universal jurisdiction applying to international crimes such as war crimes, um, torture, and um, crimes against humanity and genocide, and also piracy and slavery, but the, a, a slightly different justification applies in that case. Um, and so in these cases, in these grave breaches of international law, these super um, serious crimes, the principle that the victim has to be in your country, that the perpetrator has to be in your country, or that the crime occurred within your territory doesn't apply. Um, why is universal jurisdiction important? It's important because it's a way of closing the impunity gap that exists. Um, it allows more countries to assert jurisdiction over the crime and therefore hopefully prevent the abuser from finding safe haven in another country where the crime didn't occur. Um, and it allows victims to, pro to um, find access to justice even if their country is not in a position um, to prosecute the crime or if, for example, they've had to flee um, the jurisdiction in which the crime occurred and find refuge elsewhere which is really common in these cases. Um, it's also important because international courts and international prosecutions like the International Criminal Court or the hybrid tribunals that we've seen are very costly. And um, you know, domestic prosecutions are more um, pragmatic, as <laughs> Carmen would say. Um, so kind of the first time or the, the most, the, the case that a lot of people know about that illustrates this principle of universal jurisdiction was the case of Pinochet, the Chilean dictator who, um, he traveled to the United Kingdom for um, a medical procedure and um, Spain at the time had issued, had a universal jurisdiction statute and had issued an arrest warrant for him um, and asked for the UK to extradite him. And, um, you know, the British House of Lords had to then decide, well, can Pinochet be extradited to Spain where Pinochet did not commit a crime, the victims of his crime were not present within Spain's jurisdiction, <coughs> and Pinochet is not Spanish. Um, and the House of Lords held that because the crimes that Pinochet had committed were so heinous, he could be extradited to Spain to face these charges under the principle of universal jurisdiction. And that was really one of the first times where this principle was, um, was exercised and upheld. Um, and we've seen it be built on um, a number of countries, I think, I have the statistic here that like three quarters of um, the UN member states have passed some form of universal jurisdiction law. Um, and there's definitely a growing movement um, towards prosecuting individuals who have committed grave human rights abuses outside of their um, jurisdiction. Um, so th there are some difficulties with universal jurisdiction um, and we're seeing these um, come into play as universal jurisdiction is being used um, 
you know, it's a grey area. Nobody's really, there are some um, disagreements about how far it extends. Um, does it does it extend to all crimes against humanity? Um, there's also um, disagreement about when um, immunities apply. There's concepts in international law around sovereign immunity, when a head of state can be prosecuted for a crime while he's still sitting. Most people would say no. Um, but but the, there, are, there are disagreements um, and they're unresolved. Um, there's also a question of political will. Um, prosecutions, even at the domestic level, are expensive and require an investment of resources. Countries often don't want to invest resources when they have no connection to the crime. Um, it, it's, it becomes difficult to justify. So there's a, a problem of political will. Um, there's also um, the practical issue of resources and capacity. You know, our criminal justice system is overwhelmed anyway. Um, should we really be prosecuting cases which don't have a very strong connection to the United States? Um, there's also the issue of the potential for abuse, of political abuse, when uh, you know, states may abuse the concept of universal jurisdiction in order to put pressure on countries when they shouldn't necessarily be doing so. Um, so those are kind of the issues that are floating around. We at CJA do take the position that universal jurisdiction is a strong avenue for holding human rights abusers accountable because it does close those gaps. It prevents people from being able to escape um, the country in which they committed a crime and live a life um, without any form of accountability. Um, in the United States, there are a number of universal jurisdiction statutes. There's the Torture Act, the Genocide Accountability Act, um, the Child Soldiers Accountability Act, the Trafficking, Trafficking Victims Protection Act, and um, a number of terrorism offenses also have universal jurisdiction um, underlying them. Um, what's unique to the United States is that we also have this concept of universal civil jurisdiction. Um, and there are two main statutes which um, provide for universal civil jurisdiction, which we at CJA use in our litigation. And that's the Alien Tort Statute, which Daniel's going to talk about, and um, the Torture Victims Protection Act. Um, and I really can't stress how unique this is. It's a really nascent area of law. There's universal criminal jurisdiction in a number of other countries, um, but civil. A, I think the concept of civil litigation is pretty unique to the United States. Um, I'm not from here, as you can probably tell. <laughs> I really can't stress to you enough <laughs> how unique um, tort law in this country is. And, um, you know, I think it's pretty exciting that we have these tools at our disposal. Um, and is a in some ways throws sharp relief to how infrequently universal criminal jurisdiction is used in this country. There's only ever been one um, universal criminal case in this country, and that's under the Torture Act. Um, Chucky Taylor, the son of the former Liberian president, Charles Taylor, was prosecuted under, under the Torture Act. Um, whereas there have been around 100 cases filed um, under the ATS and the TVPA, um, if not more. Um, and so that's really exciting, and we're pushing that forward at CJA. How am I doing on time? You're doing fine. You have about two more minutes. Um, so, so the way that CJA is using um, universal civil jurisdiction. So, we bring cases under the ATS and the TVPA in US courts um, ourselves to try and close these impunity gaps against 
um, human rights abusers who are seeking safe haven, either, either seeking safe haven here or who travel here. Um, and we then, um, you know, leverage those cases um, sometimes to try and help bring domestic prosecutions. Um, and I think Nishin will talk a little bit about how we use our cases in the US to kind of support movements that are happening um, at the grassroots back within the country where the crimes occurred. Um, we also, you know, support, use our cases to support extradition efforts of um, defendants back to the country in which they committed crimes. And Daniel may touch upon that, I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> um, and um, we, we also um, support where universal criminal, juristic criminal cases are happening. Um, you know, we use the um, knowledge that we develop to support those cases. Um, you've probably heard about um, the cases that are being brought in Germany and in France and in Sweden um, by the domestic war crimes units there, and they're using their own universal criminal statutes um, to bring cases um, about what's happening in Syria. So we support those cases. Um, and we also leverage um, the international criminal tribunals. Um, like for example, we do quite a lot of work at the Cambodia tribunal, which while the international tri criminal tribunals are not using universal jurisdiction per se, they are strengthening international criminal law, which is the foundation of universal jurisdiction. No, Daniel. 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 I'm sorry. Daniel. I turned it off there. You turned it off. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Dan McLaughlin, I'm a senior staff attorney at CJ. Um, and maybe just to back up, I know there's a number of lawyers in the room, but there's also probably, hopefully, I really do hope that there are some non lawyers in the room as well. Good. <laughs> but bless you for coming. Um, I'm sorry. So, <laughs> so, you know, when we talk about uh, the criminal jurisdiction or civil jurisdictions, um, you know, there's these criminal cases that the government can bring, and they're criminal in that um, the government's the one prosecuting them, uh, and at the end of that, if there's a successful conviction, then you have potential jail time. That's not what we do, right? We're not the U.S. government. We don't have the power to compel that. Uh, what we can do is bring civil cases. So we represent victims, victims' families, in individual suits against defendants. Uh, at the end of that, as potential money judgment, though the money is not the point of what we do. Oftentimes it's to provide a forum to tell the story um, so that there's some judicial official acknowledgement that these wrongs took place and that this individual defendant is responsible for the harm uh, that he caused to the family. Um, and what we, so what we do at CJ, the core of what we do is litigation on behalf of atrocity crime victims. And as an organization that's based here in the United States, in San Francisco, um, central to that mission are these two civil statutes that Ella mentioned. One is the alien tort statute, and it doesn't get a little bit legal, so you have to apologize. I, I apologize. It's a, it's a CLE, I know we have to do it. But it's also a virtual gala, so it should be a little fun, which it's not gonna be. Okay. <laughs> Um, I want to teach you something. Yeah, okay. So there's the Alien Tort Statute, which was passed back in 1789 by the first U.S. Congress. And then there's this other statute, the Torture Victim Protection Act, which was passed more than 200 years later in 1992. Um, what I want to focus on is the first of those and the older one, uh, the ATS. So the ATS is this very short statute which reads in full that the district courts shall have original jurisdiction over any civil action by an alien for by an alien for a tort only committed uh, in violation of the law of nations or a treaty of the United States. Um, so the reference to the law of nations in that statute basically hitches the statute to international law. So international law helps to define the types of claims that you can bring 
under the ATS. Um, for the first 200 years, the ATS sort of lays dormant. It's not really used, and particularly not used in a sort of human rights way. Fast forward to sort of mid 20th century and the emergence of the human rights movement. And as reflected in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, um, in the US-led efforts of the Nuremberg Tribunal, this idea begins to take hold that um, in addition to sort of the traditional law of, uh, of nation violations like piracy, um, there are additional law of, law of nation violations like torture, genocide, crimes against humanity that are condemned by all nations. So that the torturer, like the pirate before him, sort of becomes the enemy of all mankind. Um, and the first real wave of ATS litigation, um, the sort of the, we often point to the 1980 decision by the Second Circuit in Philardega. That was a suit brought under the ATS by a Paraguayan national against another Paraguayan national who was a former uh, government official for crimes committed in Paraguay. Um, that Paraguayan defendant was now residing in the US. And the court in that case said that, yes, you can use the ATS to bring sort of modern human rights um, type claims under the ATS for crimes uh, or torts that were committed outside the US. Um, and this was, you know, this was revolutionary at the point. And at that point, and um, you had a sort of first wave of ATS suits that were directed against typically government officials who committed crimes back in their home country, um, oftentimes who were very close to US military, US government officials, and then when democratic reform took hold in their home countries, uh, particularly in Latin America, they came to the US and relocated here. And so the, the ATS allowed victims to file suit in US courts for these violations that took place in their home country. Um, in the early 2000s, there was sort of a second wave of ATS suits um, as plaintiffs started not only suing individuals, but also corporations. And so as you can imagine, given their deep pockets, um, there was a sort of concerted pushback and a well-funded one against sort of broadening the scope of the ATS. Once the corporations got sued, particularly, um, there was this real focus on trying to narrow the scope of the ATS so that it wouldn't reach corporations. But as part of that blowback, individual suits against individuals also got increasingly difficult. Um, in 2005, the Supreme Court took its first sort of modern day ATS suit in Sosa. And the sort of the positive side of that um, Supreme Court decision was that the Supreme Court stated that it's okay to look at a sort of developing law of nations, that you're not fixed to the original violations back in 1789, but you can look at the way in which the law of nations has evolved over time. Um, and while I didn't say explicitly, to us that meant then you can look at genocide, torture, crimes against humanity, those kinds of crimes. The flip side of it is that at the same time, even that Supreme Court decision was um, guarded, let's say, um, in that they said that the courts have to be vigilant doorkeepers um, and that any violation of the law of nations had to be specific, universal, and obligatory uh, for you to be able to bring a suit under the ATS. Um, um, so, you know, Sosa, the ATS was sort of still alive uh, post SOSA, um, but there was this potential shrinking of space. Um, then in 2013, in an addition, another Supreme Court decision in Kiobel, the window for ATS cases got even slimmer. Um, there, the court found that um, the presumption against extraterritoriality applied to ATS claims, meaning you can bring an ATS claim, but it has to and this is vague, sufficiently touch and concern the territory of the United States in order to displace this presumption. Um, the Supreme Court did not give very much guidance, if any, on what that test means, how you're supposed to apply it. But in the wake of the Keoghle decisions, district courts, appellate courts, increasingly found that 
you know, the, the original Florida case I was talking about where you have a Paraguayan defendant, Paraguayan plaintiff for crimes committed in play, uh, Paraguay, the sort of what we refer to sometimes as the safe harbor cases where the defendant comes to the U.S. and is using the territory of the U.S. as a safe harbor from prosecution back in his home country. Those were increasingly dismissed by district courts based on the Kiobel decision. The district court started saying, well, you need to touch and concern the U.S. and there's nothing here that touches or concerns the U.S. Our arguments were that, look, the defendants are using the U.S., that the U.S. has an interest in not being used as a safe haven for, by human rights abusers. But that no longer, in many cases, was sufficient. Courts started looking for, you know, is there a U.S. plaintiff? Is there a U.S. defendant? Um, were the crimes committed in the U.S.? And the type of work that we do, the answer oftentimes is no. We have foreign plaintiffs, foreign defendants, and crimes committed in foreign lands. And so increasingly, our cases under the ATS were dismissed. And then last year, um, that increasingly narrow window, I'm done. You're done. Um, <laughs> that increasingly narrow window. Just ask faster, that's why they keep looking at yeah. you. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna get in trouble if I go over here. Um, it, the increasingly narrow window got closed even more. Um, in the Jesner decision that came out in April of last year, there the Supreme Court said, you can never bring an ATS claim against a foreign corporation. It doesn't matter. US. Foreign. <laughs> <laughs> against a, a foreign corporation. Um, and um, so, you know, the Jesner decision only applies to foreign corporations. There's still this like potential window for U.S. corporations or claims against individuals that touch and concern the U.S., uh, but it's narrow. So an example of that, um, we brought suit a while ago, 2010, 2011, when, when did we file the horror suit? In the mid, in, no, uh, the, the Barriento suit. Do that, yeah, it's before I started, so that's, um, so let's say a couple years ago, we filed the uh, Hara v. Barrientos suit. So we were representing the family of Victor Hara, who is a renowned Chilean uh, singer, songwriter, and political activist, who in the days after the coup, the Pinochet coup in Chile, was rounded up with a number of students, taken to what is now named Victor Hara Stadium, tortured and killed. Uh, and for years, the family couldn't get any information on who had committed these crimes, who was responsible. They had to flee Chile, go to the UK. Um, eventually, individuals started coming out and providing information about who was at what was then called Chile Stadium, now called Victor Hara Stadium. One of those individuals was identified as living in Florida. That individual was now a US citizen, uh, and that individual stated that he was under no circumstances gonna to return to Chile because he didn't want to face justice there for the alleg then allegations of his involvement in the crime against Victor Hara. So uh, we filed suit on behalf of the family against this individual using uh, the ATS and the TVPA. Our claims under the ATS were dismissed by the court. And we argued, look, this guy has said, he, is, he has stated publicly to the press I'm not going back to Chile because I don't want to be held accountable. So he has said that he's using the US as a safe haven. But the court said, that's not enough. Crimes took place in Chile. Defendant at the time was a Chilean citizen, not a US citizen. And your victims are uh, Chilean and British. Um, so those claims were dismissed. We then brought, we appealed that at some point up to the 11th Circuit, got killed. They said, absolutely not. The law is such that the ATS claims are dismissed. So we had to give some thought internally of, do we want to bring this before the US Supreme Court? And after much deliberation and in consultation with the clients, the decision to, was made not to do so because we did not want to enshrine this very, to our eyes, very bad law um, into Supreme Court jurisprudence because they have not yet explicitly come out and say um, these you know, safe haven-like cases are over. They have not said so. They've implied that that might be the case. But we don't want to put forward a case which would be a vehicle for him, them to sort of put the final nail in the coffin of the ATS. That all sounds really depressing. So I wanted to end with a little bit more optimism. 
impossible. Um, the first is that we still have some um, tools like the Torture Victim Protection Act. So in the, in the Barrientos Hara case, our ATS claims were dismissed, but ultimately we went to trial and won on the TVPA claims, and there was a finding by the jury that Barrientos was guilty of the torture and extrajudicial killing of Victor Hara under the TVPA and ordered to pay the family $28 million in compensatory and punitive damages. So that's a victory where some of our claims under the ATS were dismissed, but we still had this strong legal tool in the TVPA. Number two is there are some ATS suits that are continuing to go forward in the courts. One, our colleagues at the Center for Constitutional Rights have successfully moved forward claims against US-based contractors for crimes committed at Abu Ghraib, um, and those are based also under the ATS and some other claims. And then um, our own very, our very own Nushin Sakarati recently, um, I, I can mention it, but it's not, it's not at the heart of the CLE. I'll turn off the video then. Um, she, all right, without mentioning it, she did very good, she won a decision which was very positive in, uh, for our, one of our ATS claims for uh, crimes committed in Liberia. Um, and then finally is that, you know, part of our job as lawyers is to look for new legal tools, all right? So the ATS didn't exist in the 70s in this form, and then it did, and now that space is shrinking, so now we have the TVPA, but we also look to other legal tools, other legal tools here in the U.S., but then also other legal forums, you know, looking, you know, looking to Europe, looking to Latin America, looking to other jurisdictions where we can do the work that we do on behalf of victims, uh, and the legal tools are not sacrosanct. They're not, they're just, they're tools that we use to try to provide some justice to victims and accountability to perpetrators. And just because one tool is gone doesn't mean that we don't continue to look for others. So, so I have to make a confession. Um, <coughs> I was asked to speak about my cases and then right before coming here I was told I'm not allowed to speak about my cases <laughs> because we're lawyers and we are so afraid of um, breaking the rules. And so this is going to be a really metaphysical discussion. <laughs> no, it's fine. So apparently the California Bar Association in accrediting CLEs has told us that we're not allowed to talk about any of our active cases. Um, so if you want to learn more about our active litigation, the cases are going to court, come visit our website or just talk to us after this. I like to start whatever I say with a joke, so I'm not being like angry about this. But um, So I think one of the things I just wanted to flag is why should a country like the U.S. create laws that allow us to litigate um, violations of human rights committed in a foreign country by a foreign defendant and a, a foreign victim. Like why, why should the U.S. actually open its court system where, where something happened that has absolutely nothing to do with the United States? And I'm opening that to the <laughs> audience, actually. Like, why would this be an issue that countries should enact such laws? Because it's the right thing to do. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and what else? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why? You can probably get this hopefully similar result in other countries as well. They, they reciprocate. You should come work for us. <laughs> that's my answer. <laughs> I mean, the truth of the matter is in the countries where these human rights abuses occurred, these are conflict countries. Syria is a really strong example of this. How can we expect Syria to be able to prosecute its own war criminals right now when these individuals are in power? But these individuals are traveling a lot. So like we're all witnessing these abuses happening in the media and we feel powerless to this and creating systems like universal jurisdiction gives us that power to actually hold perpetrators accountable because often they, they are the ones that are still in control of their country and they ensure that they can never be prosecuted in their home country. And the US is actually a prime example of never being able to prosecute uh, your own torturers and war criminals in your own country. So we have to create these systems in foreign countries so that essentially there can be a world where there can't be impunity for war crimes, torture, crimes against humanity, um, because people travel. 
especially high level people and rich people travel a lot. So make a world where it's very hard for them to travel to a country where um, you know, they can avoid uh, being prosecuted for these crimes. And so the work I'm doing right now uh, it actually really highlights an example of a country that has not been able to prosecute its own war criminals, and that's Liberia. Is anyone old enough here to remember the Liberian Civil War and Charles Taylor? <laughs> what do you guys remember from that time? <laughs> I was looking directly ahead of me and they looked very young. So <laughs> what were some of the abuses that we saw in the media at the time of the Liberian Civil War. Does anyone remember these atrocities? I think Child Soldiers started, he cut out of his head. Was Child Soldiers was a huge one. That was like one of the most famous images coming out of Liberia. He was also our former colonizer. Yeah. So just to repeat what Pamela is saying, by the way, Pamela is the one who hired me nine years ago, so I owe her my life and everything, so I have to always credit her. <laughs> the fact that I exist and sit here is because of this woman. Um, but yeah, I mean, Liberia is kind of considered a, almost a U.S. colony because it was founded by uh, freed American slaves. Um, in the 1990s, a civil war broke out that lasted over a period of 14 years. And during that period, there was a lot of journalism happening and we saw some of the most serious human rights abuses um, that we'd witnessed in a long time. Um, about 250,000 civilians were killed, over a million people were displaced. We saw mass conscription of child soldiers. It was one of the first times we'd been exposed in the media, seeing images and videos of just young, children as young as seven years old holding AK-47s um, and you know being given drugs to be able to participate in these acts. I mean, Liberian atrocities were so bad; people created laws, you know, essentially to ensure that these types of violations don't happen in the future. Um, but we also saw things like massacres of 600 people in one night. Um, we saw mass rape was being discussed quite broadly. Um, and then we had these perpetrators like Charles Taylor were just almost flaunting their war crimes because they would have journalists following them um, because they felt so safe in their own country where impunity had lasted for so long to be able to commit these types of atrocities. So. You know, fast forward a little bit, um, Liberia finally, when it ended its civil war in 2003, it established a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The, the crimes there were so widespread and had happened for so long that they first needed to do a proper accounting of those violations. And over a very short period of time, um, this Truth and Reconciliation Commission came out with a 500-page report and recommended the prosecution of 98 individuals for the most serious atrocities. And these atrocities ran the gamut of some of the, the types of violations where we've all said we will never allow violations like this to go unpunished. These are the types of violations. This is, you know, using, um, like, for example, torture, um, extrajudicial killing, ethnic cleansing essentially was happening in Liberia. Rape as a weapon of war was being used quite widespread. Cannibalism was actually being used as a widespread tool. Um, these are the types of atrocities where we said we will ensure prosecution of these atrocities under international law. And although the TRC had made these recommendations and recommended setting up a special court uh, with international support because at that time, Liberia's judicial system was completely decimated. Um, most of the people who were professionals either fled or were killed over the period of the Civil War. So as the country was rebuilding, it asked for international assistance in order to set up this mechanism. But nothing happened. Um, and this was over 10 years ago when these recommendations were made back in 2009. Um, instead, individuals like Charles Taylor were prosecuted by other tribunals for other crimes. So Charles Taylor was prosecuted by the Sierra Leone Tribunal um, for his involvement in atrocities in Sierra Leone, which was the neighboring country to Liberia. Um, all the other individuals who were listed, uh, who were recommended for prosecution, remained in Liberia or moved overseas and lived a quite comfortable life. Um, some of them even became senators in Liberia and won re-election. 
So Liberia was this very strong example of um, impunity existing and we, our international legal system was failing until several victims groups decided to engage universal jurisdiction. Um, they saw that a lot of these perpetrators that had been recommended for prosecution were living in Europe and living in the United States and they wanted to act. They saw that their own country, even though it set up this TRC system, had made this incredible recommendation to prosecute these individuals. Their country was not capable of doing this, so they needed to seek, they needed to go to these foreign countries to seek support. And that's where we see UJ in action. And right now, we have five separate countries, have five criminal indictments against Liberian war criminals for the atrocities committed in the Liberian Civil War. Um, I'm not allowed to talk about CJA's case for some reason, but please go on our website <laughs> if you would like to hear about the very yes. historic case that we filed. <laughs> um, but, you know, the case that we filed was quite symbolic in the Civil War as well, and it was very shocking to a lot of the victims in Liberia that a case like ours could only be brought as a civil suit. And that's because the criminal jurisdiction in the US uh, was created after the Liberian Civil War, and our criminal laws do not apply retroactively. So we had to bring it as a civil claim um, in the United States, whereas in Europe, a lot of the criminal, universal criminal statutes um, were either enacted before the Liberian Civil War or are, were set up to recognize a retroactive application because honestly, torture has been a crime for a very long time. It's not really a shock that somebody should be held accountable for torture. Um, so from this movement where we see five different countries bringing cases against five different perpetrators involving the Liberian Civil War, we've suddenly seen this resurgence in Liberia of people demanding justice in their home country. And it's really this incredible grass mo grassroots movement that we've been witnessing. Um, so from the power of these UJ cases, you now are seeing activists, once again, 10 years later, demanding their own country, which is now stabilized, so it no longer has the excuse that it's focused on post-conflict reconstruction and security issues. They're now saying, look, our country is stable enough. Please, let's prosecute people for the worst crimes that we've ever witnessed in Liberia. We'll never be able to move on as a democracy if we don't see individuals who have executed 600 people in a single night held accountable. Um, in a court of law. And I think that this is one of the most exciting ways in which international law works. Uh, when you actually, because a lot of our cases were so removed, I mean, we're litigating these cases in the US, the victims are in you know, Liberia or in Chile, uh, but to see how closely connected the impact can be with these cases is very inspirational. This is how international law should work. Um, we're trying to close the impunity gap by holding these individuals accountable wherever possible because it's not possible in their home country right now. And then it's engaging the domestic system to reconsider uh, what they've been doing, reconsider why they haven't actually prosecuted their own perpetrators. And, you know, TBD with Liberia, who knows, maybe in a year we're actually going to see the first prosecution uh, for civil war violence there. Um, and honestly, right now we're seeing this in the news every day where someone's coming forward demanding justice for this crime or that crime. Um, it's gotten to the point where the president of Liberia can no longer avoid comments on the issue because it's being demanded of him um, to act. So I think you know, we're seeing this really incredible potential transition happening in that country. I think I've met my 10 minutes requirement, right? <laughs> I ended it so well, Carmen. Don't make me continue. So I was gonna say, I was gonna say that I actually, I mean, as you can see, I probably have the easiest job here at CJA because I work with such talented colleagues. But they also give me so much grief. It's unbelievable. <laughs> it's good nature. Um, so, um, so that was awesome. And uh, so I wanted to sort of round out the comments um, tonight by just um, talking about another way in which we are um, using. U.S. Um, civil litigation um, to uh, try to fill in that impunity gap, um, and so um, so since 2012, uh, CJA has been uh, undertaking investigations related to uh, atrocity crimes that have been committed um, in Syria by both the regime and other parties to the conflict. 
Um, and in a lot of ways, we view the investigative work that we do um, around Syria um, to be laying the groundwork for, um, um, for a future, um, for a, a future accountability for um, potential transitional justice um, post-conflict. Um, and so um, uh, after uh, several years of investigation, CJA um, in 2016, along with our co-counsel Sherman and Sterling, um, filed a case um, in a U.S. court under the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act um, against the Assad regime uh, for um, its um, role in the uh, extrajudicial killing of Marie Colvin, who is an American journalist who worked for the Sunday Times of London. Um, and she was killed in um, a targeted attack um, on a media center um, during the siege of Homs. And, um, and it, you know, this case is um, interesting for a number of reasons. Um, for CJA, <coughs> Um, it's uh, one of the few cases that we bring against a government. Um, most of the um, ways in which um, we litigate using the TVPA or the ATS are against individuals. Um, and um, and so, um, so this was a little bit unusual for our organization. And, um, and, uh, and, and for us, this was also um, you know, an attempt to branch out um, and use a different uh, legal tool um, beyond the TVPA and the ATS, um, this idea of the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. Um, before I get into the sort of you know legal part of what the Foreign so Sovereign Immunities Act or the FSIA allows us to do here, um, you know it's maybe worth noting sort of what the case was about. So Marie Colvin um, was a war correspondent who was famous for um, um, reporting on the stories of the civilians who were impacted by conflict. Um, and during the siege of homes, she had the opportunity to leave, but decided to stay in a media center there um, so that she could report out to the world um, what was actually happening um, to the civilian population. Um, and, um, and through our investigation, we discovered that, um, the, that senior Syrian military um, officials um, had uh, you know, essentially plotted an attack, a direct attack on the media center um, where she was broadcasting out of. Um, and they had discovered where she was um, located through sort of a system of informants um, and uh, through electronic surveillance. Um, and, uh, and in sort of the early dawn hours, um, launched an attack on the media center um, where she and uh, a French photojournalist were killed. Um, and um, and so, so we brought the suit under the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. And the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act sounds exactly like what it is, right? It actually is a law that is designed um, to ensure that foreign states are immune from suit in the United States. Um, and that's the default at international law, as Ella was mentioning sort of in her opening remarks, right? Like normally we don't, um, uh, sort of the system of international law and these ideas of comedy um, mean that um, states don't haul each other into court um, in, their, you know, in their own countries. So, um, but, uh, but foreign sovereign immunity um, laws you know, in jurisdictions around the world um, carve out all sorts of um, exceptions um, to this general rule against sovereign immunity. Um, the most common exception are sort of commercial exceptions. Um, so for example, um, you know, if Brazil enters into some sort of agreement with an American company and then the state and then the government of Brazil somehow reneges on that, um, you know, they're able to be sued for breach of contract or something like that in the United States. Um, and, uh, and, and, and those kinds of commercial exceptions um, exist in sovereign immunity laws um, all over the world. Um, more unusual is a feature of the Sovereign Immunities Act in the United States, which has created an exception um, based on um, uh, what we call this sort of state sponsor of terrorism exception. Um, and so what does this exception do? So the state sponsor of terrorism exception is premised on the idea that the um, U.S. Department of State um, will occasionally designate certain countries as state sponsors of terror. Um, and so um, countries that are so designated may be sued under the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, um, provided that certain conditions are met. Um, and so those conditions um, basically involve, and I have to look at this to make sure I don't get it wrong. Um, <laughs> CLE. CLE, right? Um, so the FSIA is set out in section um, in 28 U.S.C. section 1602 um, through 1611, um, and um, the, ter uh, the terrorism um, exception basically requires several elements to be met. 
um, the claim has to involve the seeking of money damages. So that's the um, so that's one threshold requirement, and um, it has to be seeking money damages for personal injury or death um, that is caused by an act of torture, extrajudicial killing, aircraft sabotage, hostage taking, or provision of material support or resources for any of those acts. So it's not for like any bad act, but it's an enumerated set of um, of bad acts um, that have to be committed by an official or an agent of that foreign state acting in an official capacity, so basically state action. Um, it also requires that the foreign country in question be designated a state sponsor of terrorism, uh, which I just discussed, um, and it, the claimant or the victim um, has to be a U.S. national um, or a member of the U.S. Armed Forces um, or a U.S. government employee, so a U.S. nexus um, or identity um, for the victim or the claimant. Um, there's also an arbitration requirement um, such that an offer of um, international arbitration needs to be made and rejected before the claim can proceed. And so, um, so prior to you know, us filing this case, we had to make sure we met all those requirements. And so how do we meet all those requirements? Um, so in our case, we were seeking money damages um, against the Syrian Arab Republic, so that's the foreign state, um, for death caused by an extrajudicial killing committed by agents of the Syrian state when it deliberately attacked a known media center um, housing Syrian and foreign journalists. Um, Syria has been designated a state sponsor of terrorism by the Secretary of State since 1979. Um, and so that um, requirement was very easily met. Um, the plaintiffs in this case were Marie Colvin's sister um, and her um, niece and nephew. Um, and so they were all American citizens, as was Marie. Um, and so that um, uh, sort of US um, nexus requirement was also met. Um, and then finally, we had also fulfilled the arbitration requirement by actually extending a reasonable offer to Syria, which it ignored. Um, and in fact, in this case, Syria never showed up to defend. Um, and because Syria never showed up to defend, um, then we were able to, um, that it was technically in default of its, um, uh, 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 in the suit. Um, and in March of last year, along with our co-counsel Sherman and Sterling and Erica sitting there in the audience, who was part of the legal team over at Sherman, um, we filed our motion for default judgment, um, uh, uh, which consisted of um, a very voluminous record. Um, our evidentiary submissions in that case, um, you know, uh, consisted of more than a dozen witness statements, um, including statements from high-level defectors. Um, from uh, and then we, in addition, we also had four expert reports, including one from the former U.S. ambassador to Syria. Um, and another one from the um, current UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression. Um, in total, we, we submitted close to a thousand pages of evidence. And for the lawyers in the room, you might be thinking, like, why did you submit that much evidence when it was a default undefended case? Does anyone know? Sorry. <laughs> What's that? Discovery? I'm sorry? Future discovery, no? No. You, so, want, you wanted it in to write in the facts in the case? So there's two reasons. Yeah. So the first reason is actually the FSIA makes us do this. Um, it's one of the peculiar things about the FSIA that um, just because you're in default doesn't mean that a, a judgment is automatically entered. Um, and so, um, so uh, basically under the FSIA, a court may not enter a default judgment um, against a foreign state unless the claimant establishes his claim um, or right to relief by evidence satisfactory to the court. Um, and, and Judge Amy Berman Jackson, who is our judge, um, who might also famously for you all know, be, know as also the judge in one of Paul Manafort's cases, um, and, and her um, decision on our motion for default judgment um, basically explains why this is the case. Um, and she says that given the considerations of sovereign immunity, um, a court must carefully scrutinize the plaintiff's allegations and may not unquestioningly accept a complaint's um, unsupported allegations as true. And so the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act is a little unique in this way, that even in an undefended case, in a, in a case where um, the defendant is defaulted, um, you still have to establish a certain threshold of um, evidentiary um, proof in order for the judgment to be entered. And so, um, and so we had to establish that. But the second goal, and the one that Leah, I think, is alluding to, is that you know, um, our filing this case um, was not simply to win it. Um, we are a strategic litigation um, you know, NGO, and so uh, what we wanted was for the story of what happened to come out. Um, we wanted um, a court to hear this evidence 
um, and to be able to develop the factual record and have a finder of fact um, make the pronouncements that the things that we alleged happened did. Um, and that's um, part of what we view as the value of, of these cases, um, which is helping establish a historical record. So it was really important for us to submit that evidence um, for those reasons as well. And so uh, for those of you who receive our newsletter, you probably know <laughs> the beginning that um, in January of this year, the U.S. District Court um, did render judgment in this case, um, entered default judgment in the favor of plaintiffs and awarded um, uh, damages um, to the order of $302 million against the Syrian Republic. Um, and so CJA's lawsuit here represents really the first of, um, of many, I hope, um, seeking to hold this odd regime accountable for crimes. So I think we have five minutes left for questions. <laughs> so um, how shall we do this, friends? Should I just pass this around, or do folks want to raise their hands? Pass the mic. Yes, sir. Uh, how, how, I assume you can hear me? Uh, we, yeah, we can okay. hear <laughs> You're so far away. Uh, how frequently has it been the case that when you've gone through the process of composing such a voluminous record that um, uh, another party or, or uh, litigation in, in, in the state where people can actually be reached, uh, has that record been used as a springboard in criminal action or civil action <coughs> in different jurisdictions? Daniel should answer that question. Or Nishi. Let's just say it's rare. <laughs> But it does happen, and actually, um, for example, CJ's Guatemala case is a really good example of this. So Pamela oversaw the filing of a case in Guatemala under universal jurisdiction where a record was being established of genocide against the Quechua indigenous group. Um, and there was an allegation made that, um, you know, that the perpetrators of this need to be extradited to Spain or otherwise face prosecution in their home country, and Guatemala finally decided we'll prosecute in our home country, and they used a lot of the evidence that was um, presented in that universal jurisdiction case in Spain um, in order to build the criminal jurisdiction uh, in Guatemala. Um, we're, we saw this also more recently a little bit with the uh, former dictator Chad, even though he was prosecuted in Senegal, but Belgium brought a case and you know presented a lot of evidence that Hussein Habre was involved in atrocity crimes in Chad. Um, he was hiding in Senegal and they demanded that Senegal send him to Belgium to face prosecution and Senegal decided we will prosecute him ourselves. Um, they used a lot of the evidence that was established there. So we are seeing examples of this. And you know, this is still a pretty nascent area of law, but since the 1998 Pinochet case that Ella mentioned, which was the first case, criminal universal jurisdiction case, um, now, how many years has it been since 1998? 20 years. 20 years. <laughs> 20 years later, we now have something like 127 pending universal jurisdiction cases happening worldwide. So you are seeing a movement. Um, and of course the goal is to always see these cases brought in the home country that's not necessarily available in most cases but we are this tool is now creating a world in which one could not um, hide from justice and then um, in the Barrientos Chile litigation uh, at trial we had a number of uh, video depositions from conscripts uh, sort of you know people who were doing their forced mandatory military service who were there, who testified to seeing the defendant, who testified to different aspects of the operation. Um, and a number of their testimony was new, was things that hadn't come out yet in Chile, which we use for our US civil case. Now um, there's been extradition requests from Chile to the United States to have Barrientos extra, extradited back to Chile to face, face criminal charges. So we're hoping that our civil case sort of helped the extradition requests sort of move along, and that if it's ultimately successful, then portions of the record that we've developed on the US side can then be used by our Chilean counterparts or the government counterparts uh, in their criminal prosecution of Barrientos if and when he is extradited back to Chile. Um, and we have sort of an, a similar thing going on with uh, litigation in Colombia, but that's an active case, so I can't talk about it. <laughs> Do you have another example? I was actually going to add Peru, 
Um, and this also happened in CJ's Hortado case, where which was filed maybe 2007. <laughs> Um, and there, a, key, a civil suit that we had filed against um, Peruvian officers for abuses that happened in Peru resulted in the deportation of those individuals back to Peru where they actually were criminal, criminally prosecuted with a lot of that evidence. So there are really good examples of this historically. I didn't mean to start off saying it's rare, but it is still rare, but at least we've made what before seemed impossible now possible. Any other, one more question. How do you expect to collect that amount of damages from the Syrian government? This <laughs> guy. <laughs> Were you at the blockchain thing? <laughs> <laughs> I remember you asked good questions. Um, it's going to be hard. Um, it's going to be hard. Um, so, um, so we are actually not representing the family um, in the collection process. Um, however, um, you know, uh, we obviously, you know, are aware of the process, um, and. Uh, the, the fact that the bulk of the damages, so 300 million of those damages were impunitive damages, um, is going to make enforcement rather challenging in significant part because um, this actually is not the first um, you know, FSIA suit against Syria. Um, this is the first FSIA suit against Syria for, the, for war crimes, but they've been sued for um, you know, any number of things that they have done. Um, and so, and so um, folks have been collecting um, against assets that are in the United States. And so it's not entirely clear that there are very many more assets left in the United States to be collecting. Um, so what that means is that there has to be a foreign enforcement of judgment. Um, and the foreign enforcement of judgment then gets rather tricky because a lot of times um, other countries don't like to enforce judgments based on laws that they don't have themselves. Um, and because the, um, uh, the, uh, the state uh, sponsor of terrorism exception to the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Law is actually not uh, quite, not very widespread. There are only a handful of jurisdictions that have this sort of um, exception. Um, that is going to pose, you know, some challenge. Um, the fact that, you know, the bulk of these damages are punitive damages are also going to pose some um, uh, challenge to their enforcement as well. Um, so it's, um, it's going to be hard and I don't think Syria is going to be, um, you know, kind of honing it up voluntarily. Um, but I'm afraid we are actually out of time. Um, but we will be around for another half hour or so to um, hang out, drink wine, and, and chat. Um, so thank you all so much for um, being here today. I hope that some of this conversation has shown you that to do the work that we do, we have to be nimble and creative and think of you know, different ways to um, try to fill these accountability gaps. Um, and I just wanted to thank you all for um, all of your support. Um, of CJA for being here today for your support um, through the rest of the year. Um, we would not be able to do any of this work without all of you here. Um, so thank you very much. And please give a round of applause to our great speakers. And a big thank you to the professional network. And thanks to the panel uh, and all the staff that helped put this on. Um, we're so grateful to have everybody here tonight and taking time out of your schedules.